Today we celebrate the baptism of the Lord Sunday in this season of Epiphany. Um, the calendar always flows in this way. Uh, we hear the story of Christmas. Uh, we then move into the story of the Magi, which if we had had worship last week, we would have heard, uh, which is the story of uh, the three Magi, the three wise men who bring the gifts to the Christ child, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. Uh, the gold to represent Jesus as king, the incense to represent uh, the divinity of Christ, and the myrrh, which is used for embalming, to represent Christ's coming death for our sakes. It is also likely that those gifts preserved uh, Jesus' family as they uh, needed it in order to have funds to escape to Egypt uh, as they became refugees fleeing the genocide that Herod ordered. Uh, and so <clears throat> the season of Epiphany always follows the season of Advent and Christmas. So if you want to impress your friends and neighbors, you can tell them that you know that right now we're in the Epiphany season. Uh, <clears throat> And the word epiphany uh, literally means appearance or manifestation or revealing. Uh, it, is, it means to, to come to understand something. To have an epiphany is to have an aha moment. Uh, and so today, uh, we gain a deeper understanding of the identity of Jesus because of his baptism. This is, uh, according to the Gospel of Mark, this story appears in all three of the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, Mark is the oldest of the Gospel stories. It is also the shortest and the most to the point. Uh, 16 chapters is all that, that the Gospel of Mark contains, uh, and the word immediately appears 42 times, uh, as opposed to 10 elsewhere in the entire New Testament. Uh, and so Mark is all about, you know, just the facts, please, kind of account. And we have in his account uh, this story in which Jesus comes to John to be baptized. Uh, we are told that it is not only a baptism of repentance, but also a baptism in which the Holy Spirit comes into Jesus and comes into each of us through the sacrament of baptism. And then, of course, we have the voice of God from heaven. This is my son. Now, as we move through the Epiphany season, it always ends with the story of the Transfiguration, in which Jesus is up on the mountain with Peter and James and John, and Moses and Elijah appear. And again, we have a voice from heaven that says, this is my son. Uh, and so we have at the beginning and at the end of the Epiphany season uh, a summary of what it is that we are to come to understand, that Jesus is the Son of God uh, sent to us in the flesh and that we are to listen to this one. <clears throat> Notice, too, that this baptism takes place before Jesus has done anything. According to Matthew and Luke, it happens immediately after Jesus' time in the wilderness, those 40 days in which he is wrestling with temptation and fasting uh, and telling the devil to flee from him. Uh, but this baptism comes before Jesus has preached any sermons, before he has healed anybody, before he has done any miracles, before Jesus has done anything. He is baptized. And that tells us something of the nature of God's love and God's grace. Because we are loved by God, not because of anything that we do or accomplish or earn or deserve. We are claimed by God's grace simply because we are God's. And it is in the waters of baptism that this covenant in which God claims us is declared. <clears throat> one, of the, uh, one of the challenges that many United Methodist pastors encounter, in fact, if you're in ministry long enough, I think everyone encounters, is having someone in the church who was baptized as an infant, like we will baptize Easton today, uh, who falls away from the faith, and who returns and has this, this deep, abiding sense of God's presence in their lives, and they think, 
I want to be baptized again because, you know, now I'll remember it and it will mean something to me, right? Um, and here's the challenge that uh, we pastors have. What I say to each of them is that the truth of God's covenant, the truth of God's promise, the truth of God's grace never, ever fails. And so that means that even when we humans turn away from the covenant, even when we turn away from God's grace, God's covenant with us still stands. God is always faithful. And so there's never a reason to be rebaptized because the covenant which is established in our baptism is always a part of our lives. Now, I will confess that uh, I was one of those people at one time. Uh, I was baptized in my grandparents' church at John Wesley United Methodist Church in Hagerstown, Maryland. Uh, all four of my grandparents were members there. Uh, my grandfather was um, probably the closest thing that that church had to uh, Mr. Anderson. He was there every Sunday to be an usher. Uh, and... <clears throat> My baptism was there, but of course I don't remember it. I was a child. Uh, and my parents, even though they met in that church in the youth fellowship, were never really church-going people. We went to church for a grand sum total of less than two years when I was in middle school. And so when I came to faith as a young adult, um, I had those kinds of feelings of, of wishing that I could you know, have some mark it on the calendar, be baptized kind of day. But here's what the church has taught me over the years about that. Every time that we baptize a child like we baptize Easton today, it is also a time when we are called to reaffirm our side of the covenant. It is a time when we are invited to recommit ourselves through the waters of baptism. And so this morning at the first service, even though we didn't have Easton with us, uh, we went through the covenant and we talked again about what it means to claim our side of this covenant that God offers to us. I learned an interesting fun fact uh, this past week or two weeks ago actually uh, that <clears throat> New Year's resolutions in their modern form actually have roots in Methodism uh, because of the watch night service that John Wesley recommended to all Methodists. Uh, at the new year, it was traditional, particularly in the early days of Methodism, and some of you have experienced that with me as well, to have a covenant renewal ceremony, a covenant renewal service, in which we would say, this year we rededicate our lives to Christ. This year, we will follow Jesus more closely, uh, more fully in our lives. And whenever we celebrate a baptism, Whenever we come to the table for Holy Communion, those are again times when we are also invited to not only seek that forgiveness that comes in confession and repentance, but also to rededicate our lives to Christ. <clears throat> and this covenant is intended to help us understand our true identity. Just as the voice from heaven says to Jesus, you are my son, so God says the same to us, each of us, in our baptism. We are claimed as God's own children. One of my favorite stories, and I looked and I don't think I've told it to you yet. If I have, forgive me. I couldn't find record of telling it. Uh, is a story uh, told by Fred Craddock who was a teacher of preachers in the last century. Uh, he, the, <clears throat> the fancy term for teaching preachers is being a professor of homiletics. Doesn't that sound fancy? Uh, and so Fred and his wife were traveling to Oklahoma by car and they had stopped in Tennessee to eat lunch at a diner. And you know they really weren't interested in chatting, they were just interested in having lunch and moving on. And uh, this very friendly soul came up and started chatting with them. And so Fred tried to confuse him. When, when uh, Ben asked what, his, what he did for a living, he said, well, I'm a professor of homiletics. Uh, to which the man replied, oh, you teach preachers, do you? <clears throat> so he said, you know, I have a story to share with you. And so Fred listened. And the story was, he said, you know, there was a boy who grew up in this town. Uh, who never knew who his daddy was. 
uh, his mom didn't know and he never knew throughout his life. And everywhere he would go on town, people would kind of whisper behind his back or look down on him or, you know, say unkind things about who's your daddy. And then when he was 12 years old, a new pastor came to town and Ben started going to church and then leaving before the service was over because he didn't want anybody in town uh, looking down on him. But one day he got caught. The service ended sooner than he thought it was going to. And before he knew it, this new pastor was standing before him. And uh, as was custom at that time in Tennessee, he said, uh, so who's your dad? And I guess the pastor must have seen this look of dismay and horror on his face because the pastor recovered quickly and he said, wait, I see a family resemblance. I know whose, whose child you are. You are a child of God. And that experience in that 12-year-old boy's life was absolutely fundamental in helping him to understand who he really is, a child of God. And so Ben walked away from telling that story, and the waitress said, hey, do you know who that was? And Fred said, no, I, he just came over and started chatting. He said, that was Ben Hooper. He's a three-term retired governor of this state. This man who had grown up in those circumstances was so profoundly affected by how the church named and claimed him uh, that he was able to live in the kinds of ways that led him to that life. And so when we think about who we are, we, we have all kinds of, of things that identify who we are, right? We have our roles in life. You know, I'm a mother and a daughter and a sister and a wife. Uh, all of those family connections, I'm identified in part by what I do and how I work and what type of education I have, et cetera, et cetera, right? We think of all of the ways that our identity is named for us and by us. And I want you to think of all of those things as part of a pie that makes up your life. And then remember that the pie plate that holds all of that together is the truth that we are children of the Most High God. That is our most essential identity. That is what informs and shapes and holds everything else about us. And so when we claim our baptismal covenant again, we also are reminded that all that we have, all that we are, all that we do, all that we think and believe, all of our opinions and actions are intended to be formed and shaped by the one who holds us in the palm of his hand and who calls us to follow. And so this is the covenant into which we baptize Easton today. And you know, every once in a while, I'll have someone ask if we can do a private baptism. Uh, our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters do this as a matter of course. Uh, and I always respond by saying, in our tradition, not only do the parents and godparents promise to raise the child in the faith, but we, the whole gathered community, make that same promise to God. We promise to help to raise each child who is baptized, that they too may come to know what it is to be claimed as God's own. Uh, and so I wanna invite you before we, we get to the baptism to turn to those pages now. Uh, turn to page 39 and actually then flip over to page 40. And we're going to go through the covenant together, so I'm not going to read it for you. I'm going to invite you to pay careful attention to it as we do it. But I want you to look at that paragraph uh, numbered eight near the bottom of the page. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include this child now before you in your care? That is the part where we are promising God to also love Easton and help to teach Easton and raise him up that he too may know the love of God. As we <clears throat> move into this week and reflect upon this baptism of the Lord's scripture, I invite you to reflect upon who you are and whose you are. 
Reflect upon the identity that you claim and how it is informed by your relationship with God and Jesus Christ, how it forms and shapes and holds you together. And may this baptismal covenant be a time of rededication for us all. Amen.